The Lord be with you. Let us pray. This is a prayer for the good use of leisure found in the Book of Common Prayer. O oh God, in the course of this busy life, give us times of refreshment and peace, and grant that we may so use our leisure to rebuild our bodies and renew our minds, that our spirits may be open to the goodness of your creation through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Is the sound okay, or do I sound like Charlie Brown's teacher? Okay. All right, we're good? Okay, wonderful. All right, so, welcome to all of you. I need to begin this presentation by thanking you. I recently celebrated my seventh anniversary here at St. Albans. And the contract your leadership approved included a provision for three months of sabbatical for every five years of service. And after five years and about two years of pandemic, it was finally time to go. The primary purpose of sabbatical, at least as it applies to the church, is rest. Beyond that, some will use it to research or deepen an area of interest that's relevant to parish ministry. Others will make it a priority to reconnect with family. I was lucky to be able to do all of the above. I left exhausted and returned rested. I worked on my Spanish and deepened my practice of godly play, which is the Montessori-based curriculum that we use with our children here at St. Albans. And I spent time with family members that I rarely get to see. Please know how grateful I am for the time and the supplementary funds that I was given by this parish to do all of that. So I teased this presentation with the following question. What do Uruguay, Italy, and upstate New York have in common? Apart from the fact that I went to all of these places on sabbatical this summer. Well, it turns out there are a few commonalities. The first, let's see, there we go, is rivers. But more on that later. Um, I'm guessing that some of you could brush up on your geography, maybe. Uruguay is sandwiched between Brazil and Argentina, and its seasons are the direct opposite of ours. So while DC is gearing up for summer in May, they are inching toward winter. There are about 3 million people in the country, at least 1.5 million of whom live in Montevideo, the capital, which sits at the mouth of the River Plate. You cross the river on a three-hour ferry, and you're in Buenos Aires. For the first two months of my sabbatical, my husband Mike and I decided to go deep rather than broad in our travels, and we concentrated most of our time in two cities, Montevideo and Florence. Assuming that you might have more of a context for appreciating Italy, I'll share a few more basic facts about Montevideo. Uruguay is generally considered the safest and most economically stable country in South America. And yes, the water is safe to drink. It's a fascinating blend of Latin and European culture. The predominant language is Spanish, but you see signs of Italian ancestry everywhere. In the last names, in the food. Most who live there now have Spanish or Italian ancestors, although a small percentage claim African descent. Whether due to disease or lack of settlement or a variety of reasons, there is no real indigenous population to speak of. So, why Uruguay? Essentially because of the women you see on this screen. There's a group of godly play trainers in Uruguay, and I had the opportunity to pilot an advanced training for them in Spanish, something that has never been done before in the world. I figured that my Spanish would improve most if I had the opportunity to practice speaking and listening regarding a topic I love. And I couldn't wait to see how godly play is used in a very different context. Prior to the training itself, I had the opportunity to make a few site visits. I led a session on children's spirituality um, for a group of storytellers and Jesuit seminarians at Christ Church in Montevideo. Christchurch is a non-denominational mainline Protestant church founded by English-speaking expats. None of their denominations had a critical mass to start their own congregation, so they decided to start a church that incorporated as many of their shared traditions as possible. 
I should also say that Uruguay is also known for being one of the most secularized countries in Latin America. So while the church is present, it is far from being a dominant voice in the culture. I attended Christ Church Godly Play class on my first Sunday, and then on the second Sunday, I was asked by one of the trainers to attend her Christian Missionary Alliance church plant. Their building was undergoing renovations, so they had that church that day in a park. I told my godly play story on a basketball court to a group of missionary kids who had roots in the States, but who were growing up in Uruguay. Later that week, I had the opportunity to visit Colegio San Adolfo, a Jesuit preschool and elementary school about an hour from Montevideo. One of the trainers is the principal of the school and they do godly play there. A group of sixth graders warmly welcomed me and gave me an enthusiastic tour of their campus. They were incredibly proud of their school, their country's traditions, sports, especially soccer, and Luis Suarez, and food. They loved showing me the trees on their campus and all the things that grew there. But Godly Play was not my only business in Montevideo. I was also there to study Spanish. Let's see here. There. Where are we? I began what was supposed to be three weeks of classes at Academia Uruguay, a program I recommend highly, by the way. It's just off Plaza Matriz, which is one of the most lovely squares in the old city, or Ciudad Vieja. Also on the plaza is the Roman Catholic Cathedral, or Iglesia Matriz. There we go. This is the most traditional worship space I saw in Montevideo. Note the Madonna and child in front of the pulpit. It's kind of hard to see, but it's there as well as the children or cherubs on the marble baptismal font. Both will show up again once we get to Italy. Things are going great until I started feeling sick toward the end of my second week there. One of the Christian Missionary Alliance folks who fed me marvelously at her home the Sunday before texted to say that she and her entire family had COVID. Soon enough, Mike and I had it too. So instead of leading a three-day advanced godly play training that weekend, I spent the next week in bed. I was able to lead portions of the training over Zoom, but I had to put parts of it off until I returned to the States. This ended up being a blessing in disguise, though, because I was finally able to accomplish a primary purpose of sabbatical. I was able to rest. (laughs) My trainer colleagues arranged for a doctor to make a house call and he gave me a couple of prescriptions to deal with the symptoms. And for the next week, Mike and I slept, and we read. He read Hemingway short stories, I read Cheever. And we stayed together. But after about a week, we were ready to reemerge and took as much advantage of our time as we could. We walked along the Rambla, a 14-mile public stretch of beach along the River Plate. All classes and phases of life hang out at the Rambla. We loved watching folks drinking mate, which is the Uruguayan beverage of choice by far, and fishing. Let's see, like that, there we go. There we go. The old city is surrounded by water. You can see the river plate from almost anywhere. And I can't tell you how freeing that felt. A couple more pieces of local culture before we head to Italy. Montevideo, sorry is full of bookstores. Given that I judge a city by the quality of its bookstores, you can imagine how happy this made me. Their bookstores are gorgeous and they are incredibly well stocked. The main square in Montevideo is Plaza Independencia. I walked across it every day on my way to school. And given that this is the iconic shot of the city, I figured I should include it. Also iconic is the Sunday flea market on the street called Tristan la Raja. This is where most folks seem to be on Sundays instead of church. The city's best used bookstores are on this street as well, and yes, they are fabulous. Well, I'm not going to focus on the food once we get to Italy because I think you have a pretty good idea of what that's like. 
I can't leave Uruguay without mentioning the food for which they are most well known and for good reason. At the main port, inside the Mercado del Puerto are a variety of what are called parijadas, where I had the best red meat I have ever had in my life. The beef and the sausages are cooked fairly low and slow over wood coals. My personal recommendation for the best parija is Cabana Veronica. Mike and I went there five times in four weeks. <laughs> Considering that we were down with COVID for one of those weeks, I would say that's saying something. I also need to point out Cafe Brasalero, perhaps the coolest coffee bar I have ever been in. Started in 1877, it was a favorite hangout of Eduardo Galeano, Mario Benedetti, and a bunch of other Uruguayan writers that I'm guessing most of you might not be familiar with. It was well worth the stop. The next slide does not fit thematically with what Uruguay, Italy, and upstate New York have in common. I just think it's cool. So I also thought that Matthew, who is planning to watch this later, might appreciate it. Matthew, this is for you. Mike and I went to the Museum of Decorative Arts in Montevideo one day, and Mike stopped dead in his tracks. He'd been reading a book about Chopin and the kind of piano he played, a Paris-made piano called a playel. There were fewer than 300 in the world when Chopin played. And here was one, right in front of us. It was stunning. One last glimpse of Montevideo before we go. Remember I mentioned the Italian ancestry of many of its residents? It was a pleasant surprise to encounter a replica of Michelangelo's David outside City Hall. And then to see a larger-than-life statue of Dante at the head of the street leading to the flea market in the all the good used bookstores. So then finally, after four weeks in Montevideo, it was time. We'd recovered from COVID, and we headed off to Italy. After a night to catch our breath in Rome, we took the train to Florence, and we spent most of the balance of our time there. And just as Montevideo was built up around the River Plate, so Florence orients itself around the Arno. There is no way for me to share everything I saw or learned or ate in Florence. <laughs> so I'm just going to hit some highlights, drawing on themes we first saw in Montevideo. The folks at St. James Episcopal Church in Florence were gracious enough to let me stay in their carriage house while we were in the city. That's the uh, building right there on the right. Note the red prayer books and blue hymnals in the pews. I did some godly play consulting for them, and I did get to preach one Sunday, yes, in English, but we were able to spend the bulk of our time exploring. St. James is in the neighborhood of the Basilica of Santa Maria Novella, so we started our church exploring there. Just a couple of highlights of this Dominican house of worship. There is a glorious crucifix by Giotto and a fresco of the Holy Trinity by Masaccio. It was a stunning experience to see what I have only seen in books or PowerPoints before. There's no way to even summarize the art I saw, so I'm not going to try. I did see a couple of familiar figures as soon as we arrived in Florence. There he is again. <laughs> there was a David, again, in the courtyard outside the Palazzo Vecchio. And yes, we did eventually get to see the real thing at the Academia, although it took us two and a half weeks. We had to buy tickets two and a half weeks in advance just to get in. So we also did get up to the Pizziale Pizza Michelangelo and saw the other replica up there. So, and sure enough, Dante, um, Florence's most famous exile, was there too, outside the Uffizi. It's him in the middle. It made me smile to see Dante in a relatively recently uncovered Giotto, or fresco by Giotto in the Museo del Bargello. In the chapel where prisoners were once given last rites, there was a fresco of heaven and hell, and there in paradise, Giotto had painted in Dante. A note at the museum said that it was one of the first known depictions of Dante, so even when Dante's reputation was up in the air in Florence, Giotto decided where he should go. And given that Dante was obsessed with heaven and hell, it's kind of interesting. So. 
There's a citywide exhibition of the works of Donatello while we were there. So here we go. Here we see Donatello's take on David, the lion and then the St. George um, in the background on the picture on the right, those are Donatello as well. And the Madonna and child motif continues as well. In a city full of Marys and babies, I found this one by Donatello to be particularly lovely. John the Baptist is the patron saint of Florence, and we got to celebrate his feast day while we were there on June 24th. As we watched the fireworks on the Arno that night, I found myself next to two students from American University here in DC. It's a very small world indeed. I love this portrayal of John the Baptist as a child, as well as the statue of him as a young man, both of which are in the Bargello, which is a former prison turned museum. It's a fascinating place. There's no way to even begin to summarize what I saw at the Uffizi, so I'm just going to point out a couple of portrayals of the woman depicted by far more than any other in Florence, Mary, mother of Jesus. Here are a couple of takes by Botticelli, a fairly well-known annunciation and one of the many delightfully anachronistic portrayals of Mary, Jesus, and saints living over a period of more than a thousand years suddenly in the same picture. It's amazing what could be found in churches that barely made the guidebooks. Just a few blocks from St. James was San Salvatore de Ognesanti, and there was another Giotto crucifix and an unexpected Virgin of Guadalupe. I wasn't expecting to find Mexico's Mary and Florence, and yet there she was. And of course, I cannot talk about Florence without mentioning the Duomo. The Duomo is kind of like the Grand Canyon, you can't believe that anything can live up to the hype, and yet it does. I couldn't speak when I first saw it. It was so beautiful, I cried. <laughs> Again, too much beauty to even begin to summarize. So just a couple of notes. The baptistry where Dante and countless other Florentines were and continue to be baptized. And in the adjacent museum, I saw all three of Michelangelo's Pietas together. There was a replica of the most famous version in the Vatican. Most of you, I assume, are familiar with that one, which he sculpted as a young man. The version seen here, he originally intended for his tomb, but while he was working on it, he grew so frustrated that it wasn't perfect that he broke it. He took a hammer to it. He broke off a piece of Jesus's arm. The, right, the left arm of Mary is fractured. You can see hammer signs on Jesus's arm. Fortunately, they were able to repair most of the damage, but it was an important reminder for me. Perfectionism can indeed be a tool of the oppressor, as writer Anne Lamott once wrote. Imagine what would have been lost if he had succeeded in destroying this beautifully imperfect work. If you haven't noticed, children are another motif running through this presentation. The Museum of the Duomo is incredible. I could do a forum on the baptistry doors alone. But given that I had to narrow my field considerably, I decided to see, focus on where I saw children and the religious art. I was struck by Donatello's small prophet. I kept hearing the prophet's line about how a little child shall lead them. And I was absolutely blown away by Della Robbia's choir screen depicting Psalm 150. I am not sure I have ever seen a better depiction of joy. When I arrived in Florence, I was sure that Giotto was going to be my personal MVP. If he had designed nothing but the campanile for the Duomo, that's the bell tower, Dayenu, it would have been enough. But then I went to the Museum of San Marco. I was awestruck by Fra Angelico. Again, there is no way to even overview his work in Florence alone. I'm including just a few highlights here. The museum includes the cloister where he spent decades as a monk. I love the almost casual art above the door frames. The image of Christ being welcomed as a pilgrim, 
above the room where the monks received their guests. Or the image of a Dominican gently quieting those who enter a room that's supposed to be quiet. But it's only as you go upstairs into the monks' rooms that Fra Angelico's work truly leaves you speechless. As you go up the stairs, you're met with his take on the Annunciation, um, something that writer R.W.B. Lewis called one of the gentle glories of the world. It's jaw-dropping. And from there, there is a fresco in each of the monks' cells. Depicting different events in the life of Christ. I'm particularly drawn to this one in the middle where the disciples are asleep in the Garden of Gethsemane while Mary and Martha are awake. Notice. Just saying. (laughs) And here are a couple more. As I've mentioned, Mary, the mother of Jesus, is by far the most commonly depicted woman in Florence. One of my personal favorites is in San Spirito, an Augustinian church across the Arno. They wouldn't let us take pictures, so I found one on the internet. Check this out. I have never seen a depiction of Mary that is quite so fierce. Yes, she is wielding a switch, and she's about to whack Satan in defense of one of her little ones. Next to her is another famously fierce woman, Donatello's Judith. This is a replica, the original is in the Palazzo Vecchio. I'm not sure why decapitations are so popular in Florence. David is perhaps the most famous decapitator of all time. But the idea of the small, scrappy one defeating the giant proved enormously popular for the city as it defended itself against external enemies. Mary McCarthy pointed that out in a book called The Stones of Florence, which was recommended to me by our own Cameron Sanders. And so if he is watching this, I thank you, Cameron. A couple more highlights before we leave Italy and head to upstate New York. I feel like I'm committing a sin against Florence by not talking about the great Franciscan church, Santa Croce, in particular the Patti Chapel, which is just stunning or the Basilica of San Lorenzo, which has existed in one form or another since St. Ambrose consecrated it in 393. I'm not talking about the Palazzo Pitti or the Boboli Gardens, and nor am I really touching on the food, which was, as I said, incredible. But I did want to mention a couple of places that might not make the typical must-see list. First, San Miniato al Monte, a Benedictine church and convent up the hill on the other side of the Arno, or the Old Arno. More than any of the other churches we visited, this struck me as a living, breathing, worshiping community. Photos weren't allowed inside. It was closed periodically during the day for tourists so that the folks could pray there in peace. Down in the crypt, Mike and I saw a couple of frescoes that we could not look away from. We found them later in a book, so I included them here. On one side was this image you have here of Mary holding up Jesus on the route to Calvary. Neither of us had ever seen anything quite like that before. On the other was Jesus in the tomb. Surrounding the church is this publicly owned cemetery, and I found the statue in the middle on one of the graves to be particularly moving. This idea of a mother protecting her children under the shadow of her wings, I found it deeply stirring. The image came to mind repeatedly as we walked through our final stop on this very short tour. The last Italian slide comes from the Museo degli Innocenti. The museum used to be a hospital and orphanage for abandoned children. Even now, proceeds from the museum go toward children in need. And on the facade of the building are these numerous medallions by Andrea della Robbia, like the one you see in the middle there. And on the top floor, there's a small art gallery, some works created specifically for the hospital, like the one seen here. I personally have never seen children depicted at the foot of the cross, as you see on the right here. But I imagine it might have been incredibly comforting to the children who lived in the orphanage to see themselves as direct recipients of Christ's love. So then, After a rich, full, almost four weeks in Florence, Mike and I spent a couple of nights in Rome before we headed home to D.C. Mike went back to work, and I spent most of July 
in a former windmill. Same here. In my last month of sabbatical, I read five novels, including A Room with a View, no big shock, <laughs> two Willa Cather novels, and the wonderful Lincoln Highway by Amor Tolls. Shout out to David Brown for recommending that one. I read two memoirs and reread three books by Godly Play founder Jerome Berryman. I also made up the last week of Spanish classes online that I'd missed in Uruguay due to COVID. And the silence, for me, as an introvert, was a profound gift that I can't even imagine how to repay. Given the glories of the Dominican worship spaces of Santa Maria Novella and San Marco in Florence, I was interested to see what the chapel run by the Dominican Sisters of Peace would look like. Here it is. A lot simpler, certainly, but I found it to be a truly lovely place to pray. I don't think I've ever been in a worship space where all of the figures on the walls are female. This mural was the first work by famous children's book author and illustrator Tony de Paula. Mary, the mother of Jesus, is in the center, and she is surrounded by women like Rose of Lima, the first canonized saint of the Americas who spoke Spanish, incidentally, as well as Catherine of Siena, St. Dominic's mother, Jane of Asa, Catherine of Ricci, and Maria Goretti, who spoke Italian. The relatively happy, well-adjusted redhead on the right is Mary Magdalene, who looks nothing like the per perpetually distressed Mary Magdalene I saw in Florence. There are mothers here, lay people, young people, nuns, showing that there is no one way for women to be faithful. And they're not isolated in separate windows. They're in community. And I felt welcomed by them, particularly considering that the Dominican order is the order of preachers. I felt welcomed there as a woman preacher. It was pretty cool. So I, I mentioned at the beginning that there are a few threads winding through all three places. Lots of women and children, past and present. But the rivers come back. in this last stretch of the trip as well. I spent the 4th of July weekend at my family's camp on the Independence River on the edge of the Adirondacks. The Independence River is a tributary of sorts of an almost equally unknown river, the Black River. And then once I was back at the retreat center, I spent some time on a trail I'd never heard of before, the Empire State Trail. Right now, it's a bike trail that goes all the way from New York up to Canada, and then again from Albany to Buffalo. And the stretch closest to me was along the Mohawk River, and it was just gorgeous. Finally, I had some time in July to reconnect with my friends and family. I spent lots of time with my mom, who had just finished treatment for breast cancer. I had a sleepover with my childhood best friend, something that we hadn't done in over 30 years. I went to a high school graduation party and I saw relatives I normally only see at funerals. And I had a chance to bond with my little sister who is not so little anymore. I performed her wedding in the summer of 2021 and she had a baby just as after I returned to DC. And yes, I'm going to show him off. <laughs> there he is. <laughs> I have not had a chance yet to meet Logan, but that is going to change this week. I have a conference in Philly, and I am going there by way of upstate New York <laughs> to meet my nephew first. So women, children, rivers, and me, that is what Uruguay, Italy, and upstate New York have in common. Thank you. few minutes for discussion or questions. Anybody have any questions, reflections? Did you acquire or apply an accent? <laughs> a little bit. I slip into it occasionally at the Spanish service. Um, Uruguay, um, they pronounce their double L's differently. So instead of parilla, it's parilla. Or instead of desarrollo, it's desarrollo. So uh, occasionally that will slip out in, as I'm celebrating in Spanish. <laughs> Brian? Ah, I did not. Um, <laughs> the thing with mate, it's a cultural thing. Like, but pre, pre
pre-pandemic, folks would share mate, um, but they don't anymore. And in order to do it, you kind of have to get the accoutrements for it. Like there's a special mug for it and a special metal straw and a carrying case. And I mean, it is everywhere in Uruguay. But like, you have to be an insider in order to really get mate. So if I were there another month, maybe I, somebody would have shared with me, but we weren't quite there yet. <laughs> Anton? Uh, what job and place Oh, good question. So, um, so the, the story I told um, was for the, to CMA kid, the kids from the Christian Missionary Alliance Church Point was exile and return. I figured if anybody could appreciate a story like that about finding home away from home, it would be third culture kids who are born in the States, are um, attending school in Uruguay, and in the case of two of them, attending an Italian speaking school. So they've got Italian, Spanish, and English all at the same time. So the idea of appreciating that God can be with us anywhere seemed like a relevant thing for them to think about. For the advanced training, I did the exile and the parable of the great pearl together as a side by side. And yes, I learned the entire greatest parable in Spanish, which <laughs> um, it's a very long story. So. Um, and then a couple of other things, but yeah. Um, you would think that I am fluent in Spanish based on the fact that I led this training, but no, I am not. Um, I just worked really hard and memorized a lot and, and prayed that some of that would sink in and by the grace of God, some of it did. So. Yeah, there. All right, looks like there aren't any more questions. So why don't we, oh, we got someone in the back. Oh my goodness, yes. Yeah, no, I, I don't feel like Montevideo is finished with me, and I certainly don't feel like Florence is finished with me. Um, yeah, no, I, Mike and I, once we got to Florence, we didn't even use public transportation. We walked everywhere we needed to go, and three and a half weeks wasn't nearly enough time. It is a truly amazing, a bottomless well. Um, I cannot wait to go back, and the little tease of Rome at the beginning and end was pretty amazing, too. Good question. All right, so there were two pasta dishes. One was the simple seafood pasta, which was the best thing I've ever eaten in my life. And then the, um, the last time we went to this restaurant, um, my, my husband doesn't want me to tell you where we went because he wants them to be secrets and he doesn't, but, um, <laughs> but I'll give you this one. Um, there's a place called uh, Di Giovanni. It's just it's a small little family owned place. And they had, that's where I had the seafood pasta, as well as this truffle pasta, which just, oh my lord, was stunning. <laughs> um, and yes, we found our favorite gelato place on the piazza where Santa Maria Novella was, and um, he's going to kill me, but I'm going to say it anyway. The best pizza we found was at a place called E. Ghibellini, so I'll leave it there. <laughs> All right. Marty. I, I think so too. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I can't wait. Look at that expression. Isn't it just priceless? Yes. Um, so that all being said, why don't we close in prayer? The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, I thank you for times of rest and relaxation. I thank you for time with family to rest and remember who we are. I thank you for cities like Montevideo and Florence that preserve history um, and help us remember who we are as a global people. Um, I thank you for this congregation that gave me the ability to have this incredible adventure, and I pray that you would enable us in our daily lives to find rhythms of rest and relaxation so that we can remember who we are before you as beloved children of God. In the name of your Son, we pray. Amen. Amen. Go in peace.